Good afternoon. My name is Bethany Demin. I'm the Student Interns and Lectures Coordinator here at the Family Research Council. And it's my pleasure to welcome you here for today's lecture on the link between pornography, sex trafficking, and abortion. I want to remind those of you watching online, um, well, we want to welcome you. First of all, thank you for joining us. And uh, just remind everyone here and online that we do uh, film and archive all of these lectures and put them on our website. So uh, please do share them via social media and any other methods you might uh, want to use that does increase our reach. Uh, today's speaker, Arena Grosu, is the director of the Center for Human Dignity here at Family Research Council where she focuses on sanctity of life issues and her areas of expertise include abortion, women's health, and bioethics. Ms. Grosu is a graduate of the University of Notre Dame and she received her MA in theology from the Dominican House of Studies. She's currently pursuing a certification in healthcare ethics through the National Board, uh, National Catholic Bioethics Center, excuse me. Ms. Grosu has been interviewed on multiple television news networks and her articles and commentary have appeared in USA Today, LA Times, National Review, and many other publications. She has presented lectures at the UN Commission on the Status of Women, the Center for Bioethics and Human Dignity at Trinity International D University, and the University of Notre Dame and Regent University Law School. Join me in welcoming Ms. Grosu. Thanks all for being here today. This is a really important topic because uh, we see that even um, in, in the secular circles, the, the issue of sex trafficking and even uh, the health risks um, of pornography are being uh, looked at. And we just really have to take a look at what is the link, and there's a huge link. And what I'm going to do is actually split the presentation into two, one to look at the link between pornography and sex trafficking, and the second to look at the link between sex trafficking and abortion. So I'm just going to jump right into it, the first portion. So first of all, I'm just going to give a summary of the link between pornography and sex trafficking. Um, some of the things to keep in mind is that pornography is addictive. Porn users are far more likely to use women in prostitution than non-porn users. And porn fuels the demand for sex trafficking. And this is because pornography is used to uh, initiate the women who are um, involved in sex trafficking. And also, the actual acts that these women do are then used as uh, porno in pornography films. And uh, trafficking victims are exploited to produce these films. So now let's just take a look at the saturation of porn in our culture. First of all, there are 68 million porn searches a day, and porn sites get more unique visitors each month than Netflix, Amazon, and Twitter combined. That's 450 million. And then after analysis of 400 million web searches uh, in a period of uh, a year, researchers concluded that 13% of all searches were for erotic content. And basically, uh, by 2017, a quarter of a billion people are expected to have porn access on their cell phones and iPads. Um, an increase of more than 30 percent from 2013. Now, scientifically, we already know that pornography is the same as being addicted to alcohol or drug use. And before I, I go over some of these stats, I want you to take a look at the image uh, right there. And they did a study at Cambridge University in 2013 where they had healthy volunteers and compulsive pornography users. And the parts of the brain, you can see how much uh, the parts of the brain lit up for the compulsive pornography users, which is uh, indicative of the same parts of the brain that lit up for uh, people who are addicted to uh, drugs and alcohol. And so this is because porn floods the brain with dopamine and also oxytocin. So you have these hormonal responses to pornography, and it becomes addictive. And, and so the it, it, the deeper you create this reward pathway, uh, the deeper the grooves are in the brain, the more and more habitual the pornography use is. And so uh, I would like to show a video that Fight the New Drug did that really talks about the science behind uh, the addiction of, to porn. You know what part of the brain addiction hurts? They call it the frontal lobes. The frontal lobes are located, just like the name suggests, in the front area of your brain, okay? This area of your brain is a decision-making area of your brain, okay? It's responsible for weighing out pros and cons, 
logically thinking through situations and scenarios. It's no wonder that addicts have a hard time stopping their behaviors, even when they want to. That area of the brain that is responsible to help them through that is damaged. So if pornography affects you physically, how would that then affect you behaviorally or psychologically? Well, let's look at the obvious. If you are addicted, you're going to have addictive behaviors, right? All of your activities are going to start to revolve around you getting your next fix, and pretty soon it's going to be nearly impossible to quit. All of this happens while you think you're still in control. You see, with the brain, addiction is addiction is addiction, whether it's cocaine, heroin, nicotine, or pornography. Once you're addicted, it's too late. And the thing is, you may even realize what you're doing is harmful, but once you're in that trap of addiction, what you should do and what you want to do is out of your control. All you can think about is satisfying that craving. And if you don't, you'll go through withdrawal symptoms, just like you would if you were trying to quit a you know, hard drug or a chemical drug. So now let's look at the porn industry, how much money it's making off of uh, its use. So porn industry generates $13 billion each year. And internet porn alone is $3 billion per year business. And men are more than 543% more likely to look at porn than women are. And those who have ever engaged in paid sex are 270% more likely to look at porn. Just keep that number in mind because if there's that much of a link between men who look at porn and paid sex, where do you think, who do you think is used in, in paid sex? It's uh, women who are trafficked and women who uh, are prostituted. 90% of free porn websites and nearly 100% of paid porn websites buy their material rather than create it themselves. Where do you think they buy the material? It's when these women are sex trafficked that they are actually recorded uh, during the, the acts. I'm going to show another video showing how using even pe every single person who uses uh, pornography is actually creating the demand and feeding into the entire sex trafficking industry. This is Anna. Wait, wait, don't click to someone else yet because Anna's stuck here on your computer screen. And while you can walk away, her image is stuck on the internet. See, your fantasy is Anna's nightmare. There's a good chance recruiters lured her with flattery. Perhaps they baited her with cash. Maybe they even tranquilized her with date rape drugs. And if Anna's like many others, she stays sedated with alcohol, weed, or coke to numb the pain. Chances are she faces STDs and HIV because she's denied access to protection. We don't know what she's been through because we only see Anna smiling, and they keep showing Anna smiling so that you'll keep watching. See, pornography is integral to human trafficking and prostitution. In nine countries, almost half, 49%, said that pornography was made of them while they were in prostitution. This generation fights sex trafficking more than anyone ever has, and more than anyone ever has, this generation consumes porn. Fighting human trafficking and then watching porn is like protesting a corrupt politician and then donating to his campaign. You browse privately going from Anna to Zoe and back to Anna. Watch your favorite fantasy and then walk away. But Anna's still there, she's stuck there, stuck in this life because you click. Each click, each link, each URL visit and play button, this is the currency of porn. This is the price of Anna's life. The hundred billion dollar pornography industry is fueling the appetite for children as well. Teenage girls now make up the biggest slice of viewable porn, which by definition is considered trafficking. The demand for porn fuels the trafficking industry and you can take away that demand. You can cut the cord on this machine. You can bankrupt the system. You can empty the pimp's pockets. You can free Anna by simply refusing to click. Now let's look at some studies um, done on the link between uh, porn and prostitution use. Uh, an interview with 110 men who bought women in prostitution said, those who are most frequent users of pornography were also the most frequent users of women in prostitution. Another study from 2005 said, um, and they looked at 16, over 1,600 US men who are, who are arrested for soliciting women in prostitution. 
In a statistically significant linear relationship, Monto and McGray, the study, found that men who were repeat users of women in prostitution were more likely than first-time users of prostituted women to use pornography, and that first-time users of women in prostitution were more likely than non-punters to have used pornography. And also, repeat users of prostitutes reported greater participation in all aspects of the sex industry. So they're the ones who are buying the sexually explicit magazines, books, videos, etc. Uh, so we had Mar Dr. Marianne Layden. She testified before the U.S. Senate in 2004, and she had this to say uh, in her testimony: that basically. It's a toxin. Sex is not about intimacy, procreation, or marriage. Sex is about predatory self-gratification. It creates uh, permission-giving uh, beliefs, and that they get used to thinking that this is normal and acceptable behavior, and that their behavior doesn't hurt anybody. And research indicates that, for, and she says, from my clinical experience, supports that those who use pornography are more likely to go to prostitutes. Also, pornography shapes uh, sexual desires of the users because it gives them an image of what they should want. Uh, so for example, this is one man's testimony. The more I've watched pornography, the more specific my wants have become. Watching pornography has also shaped my sexual desires. I watch pornography and I discover, hey, that really turns me on and I want to recreate what I've seen in porn. Oh, and actually going back to that, um, 80% of prostitution survivors said that customers showed them pornography to illustrate the kinds of sexual activities in which they wanted to engage. So here is pornography creating the image, the illustration of what men want from prostitutes, from women who are being sex trafficked. In the book about pornography's effects on adults and children, uh, they list four effects. The first is the addiction effect, which I already went over beforehand. Then there's the escalation effect, because the thing that originally turned someone on is not enough. And so they go to uh, harder and harder porn, more explicit, rougher, more deviant, kinky. And then, after all of this, they get desensitized from it. So something that was shocking before, this is where it goes into child porn and um, same-sex porn. So things that were initially shocking or taboo-breaking, illegal, repulsive, become attractive to those people. And then the fourth phase is you want to act it out. So uh, there's an increasing tendency that after that you want to act it out. Well, where are these porn um, addicts going to act it out? They're going to buy sex. And so this is how porn creates the demand for uh, sex trafficking, for prostitution, so now let's see again how porn shapes the kind of initiation that women get in, uh, when they're being trafficked. So 50% of international women surveyed in another study stated that pornography was used to educate them into prostitution. Another one reported that she had to watch pornography because my clients asked me to do what they, what they saw done on the screen. And then one said that as early as age three, she was made to uh, watch and become involved in that. Nine women, uh, this is another uh, study, nine women have disclosed unwanted exposure to pornography as part of the trafficking process, 35 percent, and they were shown pornography to groom them. So it's, it's, a, it's the food that fuels the trafficking. And now, not only are they, uh, is porn used to groom the women in, 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 in the initiation, but also, again, in the making of films. So uh, out of this group that was in the study, 36% um, um, of international and U.S. women, 65% of U.S. women, uh, were used in the making of pornography and threatened with it. And uh, that it was a routine aspect, that the fact that they were filmed and participated in, in, in porn films. Um, one woman said, a lot of guys film us in the act. And, uh, and also, they don't even tell them. So you don't even know that you're actually being recorded when you're sent to the room with, with a man. And these women are forced to have sex with men 12, 30 times a day. And so all of that footage then gets put on the internet and sold to different companies. So porn and prostitution. There was another study done. Um, and intervie interviews with 854 women in nine countries, and half told them 
uh, the, the people who did the study, uh, that pornography was made of them while they were in prostitution. And 47% were upset um, because of what, of what they were made to do, because of the, what was seen previously in other porn films. And again, the porn industry wants to deny the link and the danger of pornography, uh, just the way that the tobacco industry wanted to de deny the risks of smoking. So, um, but basically we can see it by, by its effects. Uh, women are trafficked into the production of hardcore pornography and hardcore porn uh, triggers the sexual desires and pathologies that motivate men to go out and act on them. And this turns uh, for women being trafficked into prostitution. So we have to be the ones to show how and, and to proclaim out into the world how dangerous porn is, not only for, for the women, but also for the men who, who use it and are addicted. That this is actually uh, a public health crisis. And Morality and Media, uh, the National Center on, on Sexual Exploitation, is doing a good job of getting that message out of the dangers. Also, pornography also affects the way these women are treated, because if the porn gets um, rougher, these women, uh, in a study that Laura later did, showed what violent acts were done to them while they were being trafficked. So 95% of the women trafficked uh, in her study had some form of violence or abuse, forced sex, punched, beaten, kicked, threatened with a weapon, strangled. Um, these types of violent acts also come from, from watching porn, especially the hardcore porn. Uh, for example, in, in, a, in a testimony, this um, ex-porn actress said, I got the bleep kicked out of me. Most of the girls start crying because they're hurting so bad. I couldn't breathe. Uh, I was being hit and choked. I was really upset, and they didn't stop. They keep filming. And I asked them to turn the camera off, and they kept going. Also, um, in addition to the violent acts done against these women, 30% uh, said uh, that they were made to recreate the scenes from pornography, and then 17% were being forcibly recorded for pornographic purposes. And Laura later uh, did an amazing study. She actually goes and meets with women who have survived um, sex trafficking, and she gives them surveys of their experience while they were being trafficked. So this is information that she obtained from speaking in this, in this study, she um, spoke with 103 women who are trafficked. She is coming out with even more studies, uh, and she goes around the country interviewing women who have come out of sex trafficking. If you're interested more in, in stopping um, pornography use and, and educating people and creating policy to stop porn use, um, I would recommend that you attend the Coalition 10 Sexual Exploitation. Last year was here. It was uh, an amazing program. Uh, this year is going to be in Florida. So if you're interested in getting involved in this aspect um, because of all, the, all, all of the dangers, I recommend that you also join. So now let's look at um, the link between sex trafficking and abortion. Uh, first of all, sexual exploitation is a $99 billion industry. And like I said before, women are forced to have sex 12 to 30 times a day, some even more, and often resulting in pregnancies. Now, if a woman ends up being pregnant, what are her chances of making profit for, for that pimp? Not high. Um, so many of them are either for, forced or coerced into having abortions uh, so that they can keep on bringing in the profit for, for these men. Trafficking is highly profitable. That's why they are forced to have sex so many times a day with these men. And so pimps turn to abortion to keep victims working, and victims are often coerced or forced to abort. And the abortion industry stands to make a profit from this, as they do from everything else, because for them, it's money for, uh, for performing abortions. And so, um, as, as I'll show later, Planned Parenthood and other abortion facilities are often complicit with sex trafficking, and this is uh, an investigation that Live Action has done in the past, um, so I'll go through that. 
So um, investigations done by Live Action found seven Planned Parenthood clinics in four different states were willing to aid and abet um, the sex trafficking of minor girls, not only sex trafficking, but of minors, and to offer abortions. So again, Laura's study, when she did the surveys, she found that 47 of the 66 women, so 71% who gave an answer to this question, some didn't want to answer, probably, they probably had abortions or didn't want to talk about it. Um, they, the number of pregnancies they had during trafficking reported at least one pregnancy while being trafficked. Uh, 14 of these, 21% of the respondents reported five or more pregnancies. They also have miscarriages. If they're being kicked around, they're on drugs, uh, a, lot of, a lot of these pregnancies, they're not getting the health care they need. Um, a lot of these pregnancies also end up in miscarriages as well. And then of the 64 respondents who gave an answer, 35, so 54% of those had at least one miscarriage, and, and almost 30% had more than one miscarriage. And then, uh, Talking about multiple abortions, more than half of the ones who responded reported at least one abortion, and then 30% reported multiple abortions. And then without accounting for possible underreporting from this group of 66 women, they had a total of 114 abortions. Now, I wanted to give some idea of whether are, are these freely chosen? Are these forced, coerced? Um, and what I want to go into is the fact that even if a woman complies with getting an abortion, she, it, we have to wonder if it's really her choice, quote unquote. This is why even people who are pro-choice need to stand up and, and, um, and be against this, this, you know, and fight the sex trafficking industry. Because um, maybe women don't want to bring children into that environment that they're already in. They're already uh, feeling uh, deprived themselves. And so the level of coercion in abortions is huge. And then others are just outright, outright forced to have the abortions. So of the 34 respondents that answered the question, more than half indicated that one or more of their abortions was at least partly forced upon them. And for example, one victim said that in most of my six abortions, I was under serious pressure for my pimps to abort the babies. Um, another survivor, uh, and she was brutally treated, reported 17 abortions and indicated that at least some of them were forced on her. Now we have to think, these women, not only, not only is there emotional abuse, mental abuse, physical abuse, as I had shown before the violence um, and the mistreatment, but on top of that, they are also women who are post-abortive, a lot of them. And so women who are survivors of sex trafficking um, are incredibly strong, but they're also incredibly broken by the experience. And so we need to come up with not only ways to prevent all of these things from happening, but also um, build safe houses for women so that they can get the healing and treatment they need from all of, all of these different wounds that they have as a result of being trafficked. And on top of that, you also have drug abuse because a lot of women will say that they cannot do this sober. Um, and then uh, on top of that is just separation from family, coercion in every single sense possible. A lot of women who are trafficked uh, are, are taken in and they have to quote unquote pay their way out of, of the trafficking situation. And this is how they keep them going. Uh, for this one uh, trafficking victim's report, testimony, which was actually uh, put in the U.S. Uh, Department of State um, Trafficking Progress Report in 2012. At the bottom of this, she said, it says, she lived under 24-hour watch and was forced to have sex with up to 30 men a day. When she got pregnant, she was forced to have an abortion and sent back to work the next day. So this is uh, obviously in, in reports that the U.S. Department of State has. We need to do more to expose that these women are, are being coerced and forced into getting abortions. So this is actually Laura's um, study, and I, and I put one of the survey questions on there. I don't know if you can see, ah, I guess I can't get away from here. Uh, I don't know if you can see, but it asks how long you've been on birth control, what kind you use, how did you get it, 
Uh, how many pregnancies did you have? So there she says seven, but um, she had seven pregnancies while being trafficked, seven of eight pregnancies while being trafficked. And who impregnated her? There she circled the pimp. How many children? She had two. Um, do you have custody? Yes. How many miscarriages? She had one miscarriage. Um, did she get morning after pill? Yes, from the doctor. How many abortions did she have? She had six abortions. And they were all first trimester. Um, and then what did she say? Was the abortion your uh, decision or was it forced upon you? Experienced both lack of options to raise a baby. Again, is that even if she was pro-choice, does, does it sound like coercion? Does that sound like um, a situation where she's really free to, to make a choice? This is where I think we can um, collaborate even with people who are pro-choice to end this practice and she went to a doctor's office. And here's a very interesting thing that Laura found in her studies, is that almost 90% had access to some kind of um, healthcare provider. And this is where I think the focus should be uh, on making sure that we train providers, healthcare providers, in recognizing trafficking victims. Now look, of those, 63 were in the hospital, and then Planned Parenthood gets 30%, and so on and so forth. So what this shows is that while they were being trafficked, these women stepped foot in a medical care center that failed them because they failed to recognize that they were trafficking victims or failed to do anything about it. And where are the abortions being done? A clinic, which certainly must mean since uh, Planned Parenthood provides, is the number one abortion provider in the US, most probably uh, a Planned Parenthood <coughs> facility. And then only 16% were done in a hospital. So either Planned Parenthood or a private, uh, privately run mom and pop uh, abortion facility, almost 70% who had abortions, that's where they were done. So again, how is Planned Parenthood and how is the abortion industry complicit with, with uh, sex trafficking victims getting aborted? Um, getting abortions. So two-thirds specified um, that it was a clinic, far out outspacing, outpacing hospitals and other sites. Again, this is, this is why uh, Lila's video is so important because it does show uh, how complicit Planned Parenthood is in this. So uh, I'm actually going to pull up another video uh, that from one of the seven videos that live action exposed to us about how Planned Parenthood is complicit in this. From there, it, it's just really watching what they say. Well, what if they need an abortion, though? Oh, that's a, co that's a completely different story now. Oh. Right now, if they're pre now okay. this is more no, just for testing the stuff. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, okay. We need to know a little they, bit. Yeah, if they yeah, come yeah. in for pregnancy testing, um, at that point, it still needs to be. You never got this from me, just to make all of our lives easier. Okay. If they're 14 yeah. and under, yeah. just send them right there if they need an abortion. Okay. <laughs> Let them this do is it. the spot. Okay. Is there anything? They need ID or something? They, they won't need ID. Then they're going to be a little bit more different, but their protocols aren't as strict as ours, and they don't get audited the okay. same way that Take them to we them. do, like with the children. The so, So again, uh, this is when, when these investigators went into this Planned Parenthood, she knew that he was a pimp, and she knew that she was under 14. And she was helping the pimp to get an abortion for this, for this girl by even highlighting, as you saw, uh, where sh they wouldn't get audited, sending them to different places. So in this uh, um, Planned Parenthood facility in New Jersey, um, she said she was helping them to avoid the mandatory state laws about rape and um, trafficking. And that's where you saw that they said their protocols aren't as strict as ours, and they don't get audited the same way. Now, the prostitute, who was the actress acting as a prostitute, asked how long after the abortion until 
she can go out on the streets again and have sex. And uh, what the Planned Parenthood person said, oh, minimum of two weeks. Um, but then you could still make money uh, by, by basically waste up or just be extra action walking by to advertise sex to potential clients. So she's giving advice to a girl who's being trafficked underage about how she can continue being trafficked um, even after having an abortion. And then, again, 14 and under, send them right here and if, it, if they need an abortion. So what's the abortion industry's stake in the sex trafficking profit? So obviously, like I said before, they're uh, the abortion giant. They're the primary provider of abortions. They um, performed over 300,000 abortions um, in 2013. That's a third of the abortions in the US. So every three years, Planned Parenthood aborts about a million babies. And again, what are the chances that a woman who's being trafficked, who walks into a Planned Parenthood, uh, will be given the option of adoption services or prenatal services? In general, Planned Parenthood, out of all of their total services for pregnant women, abortion made up 94%. How much more so for if they know that these women are being trafficked? Will they, will they suggest and push for abortion? Plus, they don't make money by doing adoption referrals, um, but they do make money um, by performing abortions. So even though they hold the nonprofit status, their total revenue is $1.3 billion. And we see that money talks. Money talks in the videos we saw of Planned Parenthood, the Planned Parenthood investigation on the sale and trafficking of baby organs, and money talks in they want to get as many abortions from as many women as possible. So here are some testimonies from women. We worked six days a week, 12 hours a day. Our bodies were sore and swollen. If anyone became pregnant, we were forced to have abortions. The cost of the abortion was added to the smuggling debt. So th to begin with, um, some of these women, how they end up in sex trafficking is that whether they were um, coming from overseas, they were told that they, there's a, a debt they have to pay. So for them to get out of debt, they have to uh, get involved in the sex industry. Um, and then on top of that, their abortions would be added to the debt. And a lot of them are, are come here um, and or even taken off the streets. For example, teens, if uh, you have a someone under 18 who's walking the streets, a runaway from home within 48 hours will, will be picked up by a pimp or will be offered uh, to be taken into sex trafficking. So domestically, you have runaway teens who get caught up into the sex um, trafficking industry. And then internationally, you have um, women who come here thinking that they're going to get a job working in the food industry or um, working in massage parlors, and, they, and then it's actually a sex trafficking operation. And then here's another survivor. I had forced unprotected sex and got pregnant three times and had two abortions. Afterward, I was back out on the street again. Um, I got pregnant six times and had six abortions during this time. Several of them were from a doctor who was a client. He did them back door. I came in the back door after hours and paid him off the books. This kept my name off any records. So again, this doctor, so these pimps try to find their, their friends who are going to help them to, to keep this under wraps. So this doctor is also um, trafficking women, using women who are trafficked. So he's also performing the abortions. Um, because of that, uh, because they were more expensive and on the street you didn't want to pay 250 or $300 or more, we went back door where the charge was more like 150 so again, actually they found too that um, we really have to crack down. There, obviously law enforcement is generally very good, but um, in other operations they found that law enforcement were also users of women who are trafficked. So we really have to crack down in every single aspect uh, to see who is, who is complicit with, with this. Um, and she said, I had so much scar tissue from these abortions because there was no follow-up and in a couple of cases, I had bad infections, so bad that I eventually lost my fallopian tubes and had to have a hysterectomy. Again, uh, in this case, there was a Mexican woman who was trafficking girls, and she got caught. But um, it, 
on there it says, the victims were compelled to perform sex acts 12 hours a day and were subjected to beatings, rape, and forced abortions. And uh, she agreed to the guilty plea, so she was caught. And she was considered the matriarch of, of this operation. So um, basically, I want to end uh, by just saying that we need to hear more of these women's stories. Um, and we also, we have to look at and really put out um, in publications and just educating our friends and family how pornography does fuel sex trafficking, not just the fact that it gets um, people addicted and then they act out those addictions on, on, on uh, these women, but they're more likely to go and use uh, women who are trafficked or prostituted, and that every single time that any individual user actually looks at porn, they're, they're fueling the production of more films, which are done with women who've been trafficked. Um, so this is, this is something that we need to bring out to the forefront. A lot of people don't want to look at the tie between the pornography and sex trafficking industry. They're all industries in the abortion industry as well. Um, so it is, it is an opportunity for us to speak for these women who are vulnerable and really can't speak for themselves. I would just like to open it up for questions. Um, Arena, what do you say to the people, uh, I've read about this on the international level in particular, who are trying to um, treat prostitution as though it's a respectable occupation. They refer to prostitutes as sex workers, to the whole enterprise as sex work. I've even heard that there's talk about unionizing sex workers and so forth. Uh, I mean, um, what do you make of that? <laughs> so I've been at the UN Commission on the Status of Women and was a fly on the wall in a meeting with about, I don't know, 150 mostly liberal progressive women, half of them, and they were fighting each other. So it was very interesting to be there. Um, half of them uh, were in favor of, of fighting for uh, sex to be considered sex work, and the other half uh, called it as it is, which is that this, this um, basically um, makes women objects and that this should never be allowed. Um, so that you have feminists who think that uh, to be completely liberated, that this should be a, a form of work that is accepted. And then the other group of feminists who see it for what it is and how dangerous and damaging and how women are objectified. Um, and so the, the actual debate is really strong at the UN especially. Um, and even uh, the National Center on Sexual Exploitation, uh, we work, they work with a lot of different people who may not be with us on other issues or even within, um, within our, even with sex trafficking, but they see the danger of pornography and they want to um, change it. Uh, so it's important to show that these women are actually, um, even if, for example, some go into it freely, uh, you have to ask, does, is any minor who goes into it freely really, do, is that person really know what he or she is getting involved in? No. And, and so sex trafficking or, or prostitution of minors especially, um, there's, there's extreme amount of coercion. And also once you get into it, uh, it's hard to get out of it. I, I actually met a survivor of trafficking that was in lockdown in, in the room that she was put in with guards outside. And she actually um, convinced one of the uh, buyers to, to sneak her out, and, and he had to come back with uh, an entire entourage to um, escape the situation. And so it's really dangerous that what these people who are pushing for prostitution as sex work um, is, is that they don't realize how um, really these women are enslaved and to even push for a, a type of work that enslaves them not only uh, morally and, and physically but even even circumstantially is is extremely dangerous and so we need to continue to um, educate people on 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 the dangers of that and that is most often not a freely chosen decision and even if a woman really finds herself in a position 
where she's desperate and, and she wants to make money and then gets into this, it's really hard for her to get out. And so it's an, institu inst it's an institutionalizing of something that is um, abusive to women. Hi, thanks for the great talk. Um, I'm part of a campus ministry on my college campus, and we brought the Fight the New Drug campaign there. We actually had some protesters <laughs> there who were saying pornography is free speech and you can't put your foot in that. So I wonder what you would say to that. Well, we see the dangers of pornography, um, and it's not, it's, again, it's not something that just affects a person individually. It affects a lot of people. And so we see that with pornography is there are human rights abuses taking place. And so uh, whether you have free speech or not should not infringe upon um, the rights of other people. And, and the people on the end in that video that you saw are, are basically enslaved. Um, and also, it's, it's a public health crisis, too. And so it, it creates uh, problems for because pornography users are more violent. And if, if they're looking at child porn, um, how, is that, how is that not dangerous to us as a society and to the common good? And so um, free speech that doesn't infringe upon the rights of, of uh, other individuals, uh, sure, but pornography doesn't fall into that category. Pornography is very dangerous, and it doesn't just affect that one person. It affects uh, all the victims, all the mol molesters that uh, act out because of their pornography addiction, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, the women who are being trafficked. Is there any pending legislation that FRC is pursuing that would cut into this that we should know about, either at the federal or state level? Uh, well, we were, we were involved in uh, a sex trafficking bill, which gets caught up with the issue of whether uh, abortions should be uh, used for, or, should, or, or if organizations should be compelled to provide abortions to trafficking victims. And I think this is very dangerous because it mixes, first of all, these women, like I said, already being um, abused and they have a lot of wounds. And on top of that, legislatively, um, they're trying to provide abortions for these women. So if, so if you escape from the trafficking industry uh, without having an abortion, well, don't worry. By the time the government steps in, they'll make sure that you have an abortion, right? Um, so I think we have to, legislatively, we have to uh, separate that and make sure that the programs and the bills that come out handle let's get treatment for these women, and abortion is not health care. And we have to keep that out of any trafficking bills. And any trafficking bills, the abortion issue, the, 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 the progressives pu pushing the abortion agenda into the trafficking bills are actually stopping good legislation from passing, um, and they're, and they're uh, slowing it from happening as a result. So I think that even at the state or federal level, we need to make sure that we keep, keep that separated. But as we know, the Obama administration is pushing abor abortion um, legislation into absolutely everything, including Obamacare and everything else and with the mandate. Hi, I just wanted to follow up with a question. Uh, <coughs> it was to Peter's question earlier. Um, you'd, answer, you'd, you'd mentioned this UN meeting that you went to and that there was this division. Was there a division along any kind of lines that you could notice, like, you know, European versus African, or, or, or you know, or was it just sort of mixed, um, or were there, you know, other people who were not feminists who were also, I mean, I imagine the, the non-feminists would be siding with the feminists who were uh, opposed to trafficking, and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and I think this is also a Soros project, right? Isn't, isn't the Open Society mm -hmm. Foundation behind this sex worker mm -hmm. um, kind of acceptance and tolerance, anyway. I, I don't quite remember which groups were, they actually had a panel of five or six people and they were, there was a lot of infighting because they had a, a few of them held one position, a few held the other position. Um, wh what was great was that, that uh, our groups, which were um, 
pro-life, we infiltrated that. So I wasn't the only one in there. Um, and we actually set up questions because we wanted to get them to talk about these things. So some of our people uh, were in there asking, asking questions. Um, in terms, in general, though, the African uh, delegations and uh, are more pro-life. I mean, Africans have uh, on average about six children. This is why the UN is pushing for um, in Africa that um, birth control and abortions are uh, and uh, abortion laws are introduced there because they want to uh, curtail um, family size in Africa. Uh, whereas in Europe and here, it's under um, two two children, so uh, the replacement rate is not even, we're actually not even at replacement rate right now in, the, in America and especially not in Europe. Um, but it's generally, those, those African countries tend to be um, more family oriented, not pushing for prostitution and sex trafficking consi be, being considered work. Any more questions? No? Thank you so much for coming. <laughs>